I want to spend the next 45 minutes or so really to explore with you all this concept of shared decision making, something we've touched on yesterday, but haven't really explicitly discussed as of yet. And I think this is a concept increasingly integral to the physician-patient-parent relationship. And as I explore this concept with you, I want to raise the possibility that shared decision making, in fact, is at risk of becoming a decrepit concept. Let me start with shared decision making today. Chances are, if you're a clinician and not moribund, you've heard of shared decision making and probably have practiced shared decision making. It's emerged as the standard uh, decision making model in medicine and pediatrics. It's been endorsed by a number of authoritative policy bodies in some manner, such as, for instance, being recommended by the World Health Organization, suggested by the United States Preventive Services Task Force, even authorized by the 2010 Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. Chances are also if you've picked up any one of the leading medical journals recently, you've come across an article about shared decision making. This is a graphic that shows the percentage of all articles in the top 15 medical journals that pertain to shared decision making. While there was only a very small fraction in the mid-90s, that's exponentially increased over the last decade or so, such that by 2011, over 1% of all articles in these medical journals pertain to shared decision making. So given this ubiquity of shared decision making today in medicine, we might forget about the origins of shared decision making. Where did it come from and when did it evolve? Well, it turns out that shared decision making sort of began in the early 1980s and its roots are really in informed consent. And the first use of the word shared decision making is generally attributed to the President's Commission Report on the Ethical Issues in Medicine in 1982, where they used the word shared decision making actually in their definition of informed consent, saying informed consent is an ethical obligation that involves a process of shared decision making based upon the mutual respect and participation of patients and health professionals. Now, the Commission's use of the word shared decision making occurred at a time where there were fundamental shifts going on in the doctor-patient relationship due to the rise of informed consent, the patient rights movement, and other factors. Paternalism was out, or at least on its way out. And this new process of a mutual respect and participation of patients and health professionals was in. Now, the concept of shared decision making has since evolved since the time the President's Commission first used it, but interestingly, the rationale, I would argue, for the use of shared decision making has largely remained similar, a process based on the mutual respect and participation of patients and health professionals, a way to increase the participation of patients in the decisions that affect them. Others have argued, in addition to this underlying rationale for shared decision making, that, well, shared decision making might actually improve patient outcomes. And this is a conceptual framework of how this uh, might come, uh, might be the case. This is a, um, from a recent journal and uh, article in the journal Medical Decision Making. Use of shared decision making as a communication function in the interaction between a doctor and a patient may first lead to improvement in this proximal outcome, what these authors call effective cognitive outcomes, which has to do with improved understanding by a patient of their condition and the interventions needed to improve that condition, or increased satisfaction in the processes of care or their doctor, or increased trust in their doctor. An improvement in these effective cognitive outcomes can in turn lead to improvement in more distal, potentially more clinically relevant outcomes, like improved adherence to a treatment regimen, a behavioral outcome, and improved health outcomes, symptom reduction, improved quality of life. And these authors actually posit that to improve these more distal outcomes, maybe use of shared decision making does not need to act through this more proximal intermediate outcome of effective cognitive outcomes. It potentially has a more direct path to directly improving behavioral and health outcomes. These authors then did a systematic review of the current literature to see if there was more than just potential for shared decision making to improve these outcomes, whether there was evidence that it actually did. And this is what they found of the studies that they included that first determined in some val using some valid measurement tool that shared decision making occurred in the interaction and then explored the effect of the use of shared decision making on one of these three patient outcome categories. Of the 50 that they included that explored the effect of shared decision making on the outcome category of effective cognitive 
outcomes, they found 54% of these studies showed a positive effect of using shared decision making, 40% no difference, and 6% actually a negative effect. Of the remaining 47 studies they included that explored the effect of shared decision making on these other two more distal outcomes, behavioral and health outcomes, 20 to 30% found a positive effect, 60 to 70% no difference, none a negative effect. So the authors conclude that, at least preliminarily, there seems to be more than just potentially or that using shared decision making actually does improve patient outcomes. Certainly they found some gaps along the way, for instance, most studies looking at the effect of shared decision making are looking at this more proximal outcome. And those that look at these distal outcomes are more likely to find no difference. But that said, it does appear that there is more than just potentially or that shared decision making does improve improved patient outcomes. This evidence in combination with that underlying rationale for the use of shared decision making to increase patient participation, a mutual respect and participation of patient and health professional have led some to exalt shared decision making as, quote, the future of medicine. Roy Moynihan, in fact, further in this article, goes on to say that the future is now. Wider public participation in medicine, patience in the decision making process is, quote, long overdue. Well, let me fast forward to the conclusion I want to get to as part of this talk, and I'll spend the rest of my time sort of unpacking how I get here. I want to retreat somewhat from this exalted position that we many currently hold for shared decision making in medicine, maintain that shared decision making has the potential to be quite useful and valuable in medicine by extending the principle of informed consent, improving patient involvement in decision making. But I want to argue that it's currently at risk of becoming a decrepit concept, old, worn out, and useless. Now, I want to make that point by making three arguments. First, I want to argue that Shared decision making is currently conceived increasingly embodies what I call a consumerist ideal and that is quite problematic. Secondly, shared decision making's relationship to similar concepts remains poorly understood and that is detrimental to the concept of shared decision making itself. And third, perhaps most importantly, the factors that render shared decision making appropriate or inappropriate are not very well characterized. Therefore, we don't really know when to use shared decision making and when not to use shared decision making. In fact, I think we're more often to use shared decision making when we shouldn't and not use it when we should. So I want to go through each of these three issues that put shared decision making at risk. And as I do so, I'll try to identify specific issues and questions that I think we need to tackle and address to rescue shared decision making from becoming a decrepit concept. So let's start with this first issue, the current concept of shared decision making increasingly embodies a problematic consumerist ideal. So this is how shared decision making largely looks today. This is the Salzburg Statement on Shared Decision Making, published in the British Medical Journal in 2011. It represents a consensus statement by a group of experts in the field about what shared decision making means in medicine. And they call on clinicians as part of shared decision making in this characterization of shared decision making to stimulate a two-way flow of information with patients, to provide accurate information about options with patients to tailor information to individual patient needs. And likewise, they call on patients to speak up about their concerns and recognize that they have a right to be equal participants in their care. This is largely how shared decision making looks like today, very patient focused and confining largely a provider's role in the relationship as one of a purveyor of information. This current characterization of shared decision making, I'd argue, can be categorized as being a narrow conception of shared decision making. Let me expound on what a narrow conception of shared decision making means. A narrow conception is based on a premise that patients have preferences and it's the job of providers to elicit those preferences out of respect for patient autonomy. And in this narrow conception, having preferences is really synonymous with those preferences being clear to the patient and stable over time. And therefore, for a provider to take those preferences into account in the decision-making process, they simply just have to ask patients what the, their preferences are. Now, there can be mutual discussion and joint deliberation about patient preferences, but those really only occur at the discretion of the patient. And therefore, the provider's role in this narrow conception of shared decision-making is really confined to contributing evidence-based knowledge, not trying to influence patient preferences, but simply integrating evidence with those preferences. And you can see how this narrow conception is very similar to what just showed you as the Salzburg statement of shared decision making. 
This is in contrast to the broader conception or a broad conception of shared decision making, which is similar, similar to the narrow conception in that it recognizes the intrinsic importance of a patient's preferences to the decision making process, but it differs in that it doesn't assume that those preferences are clear and stable. In fact, it maintains that more often than not, patient preferences are neither fixed nor known. And as a result, the provider's role is not simply confined to eliciting patient preferences, but helping a patient realize, evaluate, appraise those preferences, values through dialogue. And it even allows providers to go so far as attempt to persuade the patient of the worthiness of certain health-related values relevant to the decision at hand. So you see how these different conceptions are quite competing. And there's a debate currently going on on which ought to prevail. And I'm going to argue that a broad conception ought to prevail, at least most of the time. And that the narrow conception is quite problematic, really, in how it characterizes patient autonomy and the provider role in the patient-provider relationship. So to illustrate the problems with the narrow conception, let's match the narrow and broad conception of shared decision-making to doctor-patient relationship models and see how they interpret the central attributes of that relationship. These are the four ideal doctor-patient relationship models as described by Ezekiel and Linda Emanuel in their influential 1992 paper, and how the central attributes of patient values, physician obligations, conception of patient's autonomy, and conception of physician roles manifest in each of these four models. And you can see as you read this table that the narrow conception of shared decision-making as I just defined it is most aligned with this consumerist model of the doctor-patient relationship, where again, the patient values are defined, fixed, and known to the patient. And therefore, the physician's role and obligations are really confined to providing relevant factual information and simply implementing the patient's selected intervention. In contrast, the broad conception of shared decision-making is probably more aligned somewhere in between the deliberative and interpretive doctor-patient relationship model, where at a minimum, the patient values are inchoate and conflicting, perhaps even open to development and revision through moral discussion, and therefore the provider's role and obligation is not simply eliciting a patient preferences, but again, interpreting those values and even persuading the patient of the most admirable values. So narrow conception more approximating a consumerist model and the broader conception a deliberative or interpretive model, the doctor-patient relationship. Insofar as the narrow conception approximates this consumerist model, the doctor-patient relationship, I'd argue it's quite problematic. Problematic because it swings the pendulum too far towards the patient end with respect to moral authority and medical decision-making power in that relationship. In fact, many have argued that the consumerist model is problematic for that very reason. The manuals say the ideal doctor-patient relationship does not vest moral authority and medical decision-making power exclusively to the patient. And the commission agreed that the consumerist model does not adequately reflect the current nature and needs of healthcare. Perhaps most colorfully, Bob Veach and patient as partner wrote this, I find equally offensive the diametrically opposed model of the physician as engineer, a plumber who will fix any problem at the patient's command. If the paternalistic model is offensive to the moral character of the patient, the engineering or plumber model is offensive to the character of the physician. Looking at this more specifically, we can sort of see how the narrow conception as it approximates this consumerist model is quite problematic. Primarily, I think, it's problematic because it doesn't really advance a plausible view of a patient's values. I'd argue that rarely are our values, beliefs, preferences fixed, defined, and known to us in any given everyday situation, particularly in those situations that are unanticipated, that we might find ourselves when we're sick, having to entertain different treatment decisions or discussions about specific tests. Rather, I think we as humans live unexamined lives, and it's the process of change and self-reflection that is critical to us understanding and, un and interpreting our own values and applying them to any specific situation. And as far as the narrow conception doesn't allow for that process of change and self-reflection, self-development, self-understanding, and confines um, patient autonomy simply to being defined as choice of or control over medical care, I'd argue it's quite problematic. And herein lies the argument then for a broader conception of shared decision making. It better embodies our ideal of autonomy. As the Emanuels say in that similar, same paper, autonomy requires individuals to critically assess their own values and preferences, determine whether they are desirable, affirm these values as ones they should, that should justify their actions, and then be free 
to initiate action to realize the values. It's not just freedom to choose, it's much more than that. And I worry a narrow conception of shared decision making simply advances the view that patient autonomy is uh, freedom to choose. It also, the broader conception, better embodies our ideal of a physician, a caring physician who integrates the information and relevant values to make a recommendation and through discussion attempts to persuade the patient to accept this recommendation as the intervention that best proposes his or her overall well-being. It's not a, the provider's role is not simply about purveying information, but much more than that, helping patients realize their values, interpret them, and apply them to the situation at hand. In fact, Epstein and Peters recently reminded us clinicians, urged us clinicians to get beyond just providing information to patients, saying respecting and responding to patient preference is the hallmark of patient-centered care. It means not just eliciting, but exploring and questioning preferences and helping patients construct them. Clinicians should understand that they are part of preference construction processes. And insofar as the narrow conception doesn't allow that, I think it's quite problematic. Returning then to this current characterization of shared decision making, the Salzburg statement on shared decision making, you can see the absence of this type of role for a provider to help a patient understand their preferences, interpret them, apply them, even persuade them of the best preferences as they apply to the medical situation. That's absent in this current characterization of shared decision making. What it's focused on is information transfer, and I feel like Shared decision making, the concept of shared decision making is really at risk then of being interpreted quite narrowly within this consumerist ideal and that's a problem. I think we need to reorient shared decision making much more broadly. That doesn't advance a simplistic view of patient autonomy and allows for a broader role of the provider in the provider-patient relationship. Now, I acknowledge that this will be an uphill battle. As Gwen and Ellen said over a decade ago, shared decision making is an interesting blend of the humanistic medical philosophy of patient-centeredness and a newly resurgent and ever-growing consumerism. Consumerism will continue to apply pressure to the medical encounter, the interaction between the physician and patient. I think we have to apply some pressure back to prevent shared decision making from simply embodying a consumerist ideal. Let me move to this second issue that I think puts shared decision making at risk of becoming a decrepit concept because in some ways we have to address the second issue in order to solve the first. The second issue is shared decision making's relationship to similar concepts remains poorly understood. When we often talk about shared decision making, we often use similar words, related concepts, almost in the same sentence. Concepts and words like patient-centered care, patient-centered communication, informed decision-making, collaborative communication, even the concept in which shared decision-making originated, informed consent. And I don't think we're able to, at the moment, distinguish many times shared decision-making and what we mean by that from these other related concepts. And if we have a hard time making that distinction, I'd argue we have a hard time understanding whether we're practicing shared decision-making or doing something else. Here's an example of the confusion between shared decision making and other related concepts. This is a definition of shared decision making uh, made recently. Quote, an approach where clinicians and patients share the best available evidence when faced with the task of making decisions and where patients are supported to consider options to achieve informed preferences. Well, it's hard for me to de distinguish that definition of shared decision making from a definition, frankly, of informed consent or even informed decision making. There has been some clarifying work done to try and better distinguish these related concepts. It began in the late 90s and certainly with the Institute of Medicine uh, report Crossing the Quality Chasm where they defined patient-centered care as, quote, care that's respectful of and responsive to individual patient preferences, needs, and values. And that ensures, quote, that patient values guide all clinical decisions. And Barry and Edgman and Levitin expounded on this with respect to shared decision-making, saying shared decision-making is, quote, the pinnacle of patient-centered care, but patient-centered care is a practice I ideal that encompasses more than decision-making. Others have distinguished shared decision-making from informed decision-making, saying informed decision-making is like shared decision-making that it's grounded in informed consent, but distinct from shared decision-making because it's an individual decision-making process only the patient does, not a joint decision-making process between patient and provider. <clears throat> 
Well, given this clarifying work and some other work on this issue, one might think that the relationship between these related concepts looks something like this. Informed consent forms the foundation of each, and patient-centered care as a practice ideal encompasses all. And shared decision-making being integral is integral to patient-centered care, but it's perhaps not the only decision-making model that embodies patient-centeredness, leaving room for other decision-making models like informed decision-making. This is a rough start. It doesn't answer all the questions. For instance, where does one of these concepts end and another begin? How do I practice patient-centered care and make sure my patient is well-informed but not necessarily share that decision? These are conceptual there are conceptual and operational aspects to questions like these that I think require further scrutiny. And until we answer them, I think it's difficult to understand what the concept of shared decision making is, uh, means and is, and, and it's uh, detrimental to our understanding of shared decision making itself. So I want to spend my last 20 minutes on this last issue that I think puts shared decision making at risk of becoming decrepit concepts, potentially the most important, the factors that render shared decision making inappropriate or appropriate are not well characterized. But before I get there, let me digress a bit and tell a little bit of a story of how I came to appreciate the importance of this issue. My work uh, research has been trying to understand whether there are provider communication behaviors or decision making models um, that we can use in the vaccination context to help parents, especially those who are hesitant about vaccines, to accept vaccines for their children and feel good about it. And to do that, I went to um, where these conversations happen at primary care offices and during well child visits, and we videotaped them. And the point of that was to get an understanding of how this conversation unfolds so that we can identify potentially effective models or communication behaviors that we can uh, use going forward and test further to see if actually those indeed are an effective way at helping vaccine hesitant parents uh, vaccinate their child. And this is what we found, and this sort of helped me realize the importance of these factors underlying the appropriateness of shared decision making. When we analyzed these videotapes and we started with the question how does the provider initiate the vaccine discussion? Well, we had about 15 providers in this particular study. We didn't find 15 different ways that providers did this. We found two different ways that providers began this vaccine discussion. And one um, way that providers did this was not, as John thought yesterday, I hate you and get out of my office. It was actually a presumptive format. It presumed the parent was fine with the vaccination decision, saying something like, it's time to start all those vaccines, we're gonna be doing two live vaccines today, the MMR and the chicken pox. So give a statement, what's recommended for the child, move on. Now from a decision-making standpoint, this constrains the ability of the parent to voice an opinion, state their preferences, it doesn't prevent them, but certainly constrains them. At least more than the other way we saw providers begin this vaccine discussion, what we call the participatory format where the provider sort of invokes shared decision-making, used a question to begin the discussion, and often an open-ended question. How do you feel about vaccination, or what do you want to do about vaccines today? So two different ways we saw providers begin this vaccine discussion. Then we asked, well, what happens next in the turn of talk, in the uh, conversation? How does the parent respond to this initiation? And we stratified it by the two different ways we saw doctors doing this. When a, Doctor used this presumptive format, simply told the parent what was going to happen. Well, 74% of parents verbally accepted that recommendation in the next turn of the talk, the conversation, but 26% verbally resisted, saying, no doc, I don't want to do that. When the provider used that participatory shared decision-making approach to the vaccine discussion, we found the opposite, only 4% accepted, 83% verbally resisted. This was statistically significant, even after adjusting for potential confounding factors. Well, we went one more step further. Well, what happens by the end of the, converse, uh, end of the visit? And not just with respect to vaccines, but this other outcome, patient, parent satisfaction. Does this communication format, decision-making model, presumptive or participatory, predict not only what the parent does by the end of the visit, do they accept all the vaccines or not, but how do they feel about the visit by the end of it? Well, it turns out, this um, 
communication approach was predictive. When a provider used a participatory versus a presumptive approach, decreased odds that the parent accepted all vaccines at the end of the visit, but increased odds that they really felt good about how the visit went. And these are adjusted odds ratios with the 95% um, confidence intervals in parentheses. So this led us to think, well, ask a lot of questions, but one in particular with respect to shared decision making is, is the vaccine encounter a clinical context in which it's appropriate to use a participatory shared decision making approach? And why or why not? And more specifically, which factors render the use, as I've been prefacing here, of shared decision making more or less appropriate? So I think there are several factors. Let me sort of spend some time on um, what factors I think are important in determining what shared decision making, whether it's appropriate or not. One factor, and maybe it's a prerequisite to being able to use shared decision making, is whether there's true choice in the decision. Gwen and Elwin again said in 99, when there is not equipoise in the treatment decision, antibiotics for a viral illness, shared decision making might be a misnomer. And although a shared decision may be reached, it would be more accurately described as an informed decision engineered according to doctor preference. Whitney and colleagues agree, saying shared decision making in its fullest sense occurs only when real choice exists and the physician involves the patient in the decision. If there's not a choice to share, shared decision making doesn't make much sense. Whitney and colleagues go on to say, look, some disease processes just don't afford choices. It's not about patient preferences, values, and beliefs. It's about the disease the patient has and the treatment that's best for treating that patient's disease. When a child comes to my office with a severe asthma attack, it's not about the parent preferences, beliefs, values necessarily. It's about the fact that there's one best treatment to help that child breathe, albuterol and steroids. Whitney and colleagues urge us or remind us in those situations, we should assume decisional authority, either explicitly or even implicitly indicate to the patient the one best choice. And then it's not about shared decision making, it's about three other possible outcomes. Clinician directed decision making, they say, patient accepts the doctor's recommendation. Patient controlled decision making, patient doesn't accept the recommendation, not all patients agree with the evidence. Clinician controlled decision making, the doctor insists on his or her recommendation despite patient's resistance. Point is, choice probably matters here on whether shared decision making is even appropriate. And when there is no choice, these are the other decision making models we ought to invoke. Well, this is an important concept and factor, I think, that determines whether shared decision making is appropriate or not. It certainly raises a lot of new questions. The large and looming question is this. How do we actually define no real choice anyway? Is it simply that there's no medically acceptable alternative? And if so, what does that mean? Is it that there's no other option that represents the standard of care, no other option which there is empirical evidence for, no other option that's reimbursed? I think we have to acknowledge that there are a myriad of factors that go into how we determine whether there's an alternative or a choice in any treatment decision. Some of which are highly defensible, like professional policy and guidelines based on rigorous empirical evidence. Some are less defensible, like whether an option is reimbursable or not. I also think we have to be humble in what we consider to be medical fact and the one true choice in any decision. As Peter Yubel recently wrote, Medical facts may not actually point to an objectively superior, superior treatment, but instead, instead reveal trade-offs between two appropriate treatments. Where there doesn't appear to be choice initially, there often is. Secondly, how implicit can we be in indicating there is no choice? This conjures choice architecture and not nudge theory as how we frame a choice can predict how a patient behaves. For instance, there's evidence in the medical um, arena and outside the medical arena that if you present something in a certain way, you can actually influence what the patient chooses. For instance, opt out or opt in. We saw this in my vaccine study. If the vaccine decision is presented as an opt out, this is what we're doing unless you tell me otherwise, more parents accepted vaccines than if you presented it as an opt in, what do you want me to do? But this sort of implicit way of getting patients to do what we might want them to do raises several other issues. Is this being inappropriately manipulative? Is this simply veiled paternalism? What does it mean for informed consent? 
Lastly, how do we deal with this factor of choice with undoubtedly the other factors that determine whether shared decision making is appropriate or not? Probably the biggest one being the preference sensitive nature of that decision. You know, I said shared decision making is based on improving or increasing patient participation in the decision making process. Well, if a decision is quite preference sensitive, that makes all the, the most sense in which we should use um, shared decision making. But what if an intervention has no medically acceptable alternative, but remains very preference sensitive. I mean, vaccines are a great example of this. I don't know of any alternative than the recommended childhood immunization schedule. But yet the vaccine decision to many parents is quite preference sensitive. What do we do then? Well, Alex Kahn actually, I think, provides a framework for how we can potentially navigate when factors regarding how appropriate shared decision making is compete with each other. Now, Alex said that Shared decision making isn't necessarily one thing, it's actually a continuum and it takes different forms depending on different situations and the primary driver for what form it takes is based on the preference sensitive nature of this decision. So when you have a very value laden preference sensitive decision, we ought to be on the patient end of this continuum of shared decision making and as it becomes more value neutral, we should be on the more physician driven end. Well, I want to take it one step further. This is not what uh, Alex meant, but rather than having the preference sensitive nature of the decision be the primary factor determining where we are, I think it can be one of the many factors that I think influence how appropriate shared decision making is or where we are on this continuum, choice being one of them. You can imagine a situation where there are many choices, some of which are preference sensitive. We probably ought to be on the patient end of the shared decision making continuum. But as other factors are introduced into that decision, like there's only one best choice, we ought to find ourselves more towards the physician end of this continuum. Well, other factors I think that are important to determining whether shared decision making is appropriate or at least how it manifests in the relationship is this, the impact of the decision is on someone other than the decider. I mean, I've been talking broadly about shared decision making in the context of the physician-patient relationship, but I think shared decision making is necessarily going to look different in the context of the physician-patient-parent relationship. Child-patients child, child are generally not autonomous, competent decision makers, where shared decision making will help explore the values, beliefs, and preferences. Rather, they have a parent, surrogate, making a decision on their behalf. And then, although that doesn't make shared decision making its use with a parent irrelevant, it's still reason to explore the parent's values, beliefs, and preferences, there are different constraints on parental decision making that don't exist for an adult on deciding on his or her own behalf. Parental decision making is not absolute and we as pediatric providers have concurrent obligations to promote the health and well-being of children. So I think shared decision making, we've not yet figured out how it ought to manifest in the pediatric encounter. Similarly, I think another factor to consider is the type of intervention being discussed. Is this a one-time intervention or a longitudinal intervention? given over weeks, months, years. Vaccines is an example, chemotherapy is another example. I think shared decision making in its appropriateness is gonna look different in each scenario. Similarly, is this a screening test to prevent disease or is this an acute intervention to treat disease? A lot of how we've come to understand the concept of shared decision making really has been done in the context of a one-time intervention in the context of a life-threatening illness. Do we intubate, do we not? I think shared decision making, and there are gonna be different ways it ought to look when we're talking about something else like a healthy individual and a screening test to prevent disease. So I wanna stop there and conclude um, by showing you um, where I got the um, title of this talk. I mean, my objective really has been over the last 40 minutes or so is to identify gaps in shared decision making, or at least the current con conceptualization of decision making. And not only what it means, but how to practice it and what its effects are. And I got the title from my talk from Mark Siegler, who used a similar title in a uh, paper about 30 years ago, Confidentiality in Medicine, a Drakepic Concept. And in that paper, he argued confidentiality as a concept originally conceived was worth retaining, but as currently practiced was old, worn out, and useless. I liked his title because I wanted to make a similar point here regarding shared decision making. Shared decision making as a concept, I think is worth retaining. A concept of process of mutual respect and participation, a way to increase patient participation in the decision making process. 
but is currently practiced, increasingly embodying a consumerist ideal, indistinguishable from related concepts, poorly defined boundaries, it's at risk of becoming old, worn out, and useless. I think we have to rescue shared decision making as a result. Otherwise, it, was no, it will no longer function as a way to promote mutual respect and participation in the doctor-patient relationship. Thank you very much. <laughs>